Welcome to the Two Wealth Show, a show that shares how you can create real wealth for you and your family. I'm one of your hosts, Justin Bogard, and my co-host is Elizabeth Sickles, a.k.a. Super E. I am a real estate note investor specializing in performing residential real estate debt. I find the deals, acquire them for my own portfolio, as well as educate investors while walking them through the process of owning a real estate note. My co-host, Super E, a real estate investor, specializing in short-term rentals and the management of them. She connects investors with short-term tenants and manages everything in between. Our show is sponsored by Bright Path Notes and Elizabeth Mayora. You can find out more information by visiting our websites at brightpathnotes.com and elizabethmayora.com. Mr. Bogard, happy day to you. Ms. Sickles, happy day to you too. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's get into episode five. How have you been? I've been well, and I'm going to be even better tomorrow because I go to Florida. So, Florida, wait, who approved of this? <laughs> I am very excited. We're at in Florida. Um, I'm going to Princeton, which is 30 minutes south of Miami, and then I'll be in Naples as well, which is on the Gulf Coast. So it's two hours basically west of Miami. Okay. Is this for just uh, vacation time? Or are you going to do a little bit of business? Are you going to find an Airbnb down there? What's, what's going on? <laughs> um, all of the above. Okay. Awesome. So, yes. so this is a business expense, right? Exactly. Part <laughs> of the benefits of owning your own business. All right. I like that. Well, that's awesome. I, safe travels uh, on your way down there. And I hope you enjoy and get a little bit of relaxation while you're down there as well. So that's exciting. It's very exciting. So how about you? Do you guys have a, any vacations coming up? Well, we definitely want to get to a beach at some point. We're thinking we'll probably be able to get there over the summer. Uh, right now with school and virtual learning and stuff, it's hard for us to, to peel away right now. Um, I think our numbers in general are getting a lot better as far as the COVID numbers. And so it's definitely a lot better outlook looking forward to being able to do more things like that. So we're looking forward to it. We don't have anything planned per se, but we definitely would like to get to the beach at some point here, hopefully this summer. Excellent. Yeah. So we have a lot to talk about today and to share right. with our listeners. Okay. Start us off, Supri. E. All right. So we were talking about some of the mortgages um, that you are looking at, <clears throat> or excuse me, not mortgages, but notes. And um, so I asked the question if he does new builds and he said no. So my question for you, Justin, is yeah. why would somebody come to you for a note versus going to the bank for a new build? Well, the, the, first, the first thing, the first reason why is more obvious because they can't get bank financing, okay? So they go there, they go to the bank, they fill out their loan application, they check their credit, they check their finances, they check their debt to income. So the, the bank has a box at which the borrower can fit in. And if they fit in the box, they're good to go. If they don't fit in the box, I'm sorry, let's try again in six months. And so those people that fit outside the box are definitely um, gonna fit in the wheelhouse of owner or what they also call seller financing. And that's where we can carry back a note it can also be an individual that just privately finances somebody to get into that house as well. So those would be those types of buyers. Now, the box for the bank right now, Elizabeth, it's pretty tight and it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. As you can see, interest rates are extremely low, which is a great thing for everyone that can get a conventional loan. Right. But not all of us can get a conventional loan for, for many numerous reasons. And so there's a credit score criteria, there's a down payment criteria, and there's a credit worthiness or you know, a debt to income also criteria as well. And so that's kind of the main reasons why someone would choose to create a note or get private financing as opposed to being able to get a bank loan. So is there any difference whenever you're looking at a new build versus an existing property? Well, the collateral is important. Uh, if I'm underwriting a loan, whether it's a new build versus an older home, I can look at it a couple different ways. 
I can look at a new construction home. Hey, that's great. They've got brand new appliances. It's got new walls, new structure, new roof. Everything's new about it, right? So you would assume it's safe, <laughs> secure, and sound, right? Um, you know, pending, you know, the inspection reports and things like that. Uh, the comparables in the area, you would you'd want to be aware of that with new construction, new builds around there that it's, it's kind of different values you might see because there's not a lot of proof of concept in that area. But then in a more mature neighborhood or an older neighborhood, you would definitely see a lot of comparables or see a history of what houses have sold for and what they've bought for. Now, the risk on the other side is how old is that house, Elizabeth? Is it a 125 year old house that I bought that's got a good bones, but a lot of work needs to be done to it? Is it a, a five year old house? Is it a 10 year old house? Like what are the things that probably are gonna go wrong with it or need to be updated to show you know the signs of awareness on that property? So that collateral is important. So that's what the, the distinction I would look at in writing a note between the two. Okay, so you, so you can do notes on new houses, it's not? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's no rule against it or for it. It's um, just up to the the person that's privately financing it. And so I I would be okay with doing that, you know, based on my checklist, if you will, of things I look at and, and verify to make sure the deal is good for me and I have the protection that I want to make me feel secure in that in that investment. Excellent. Okay, very cool. Good question. I haven't been asked that question before. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's right. <laughs> so speaking of houses and single family houses, um, one of the things, you know, obviously, you know, that the fact that we're in real estate, um, it's really important that if you are in real estate or if you're thinking about getting into real estate um, to contact your local representatives and just let them know that you are a real estate investor or a real estate provider, however you'd like to say that. One of the reasons why is there's an article on February 20th um, that just came out about how in Berkeley, California, they are now considering single family houses racist. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I don't understand how a wow. house can be racist. Um, so in some of their, um, in their zoning planning, they're going to be actually adding in quadplexes. So that means there are four units in a building right into these single family housing neighborhoods. And I personally think that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so I don't wanna see a quadplex uh, where I live, that's for sure. And that's, right. you know, so, um, but the, the reason why it's important to let your local representatives know, and you can do a quick Google search or DuckDuckGo, whatever um, browser you use, it's important to let them know that because they know that you're the ones that are voting. And the reason is, is because while we may laugh about what's happening in Berkeley and think it's ridiculous, everything comes from the West and it moves our way. That's a good point. So um, don't just shake your head at things like this, but please contact um, your representatives because that's the only way we're gonna be able to protect our rights as real estate providers, no matter what, feature you're doing it because that could even affect me in the short term rental business. Right. And especially right. Justin on the note side, you know, how's that going to affect the comps around you? That's, that's a good point you brought up. So the, our representatives, our senators, our U S representatives, our house members, they do listen to their constituents. If they get enough, we'll say not really complaints, but enough um, voices that are directed at the same message they will make a change. They, they will go to make a change. So the grassroots, uh, you hear that word a lot. And so that's how these things start to change in law or get legislation going is people in the grassroots from the ground level, like just us normal constituents are talking to the same representative within our um, congressional district and getting them to make those changes, getting them to vote on the side that you need them to vote on. So if enough voices are heard, from a con congressional district, you can make a change and it can happen. And I've seen it happen. And that's what we're doing with the seller financing uh, coalition that I've talked about several times is that we get enough voices to go to your local representative. They will pay attention to it and they will listen because they, they want to know, number one, what's the issue and how can they fix it? Because they want to be voted back in, right? The next term. So this is, this is your chance and your voice will be heard. 
That's right. And one of the things that we just had passed last week here in Indiana was it's SAE 148. And it's really interesting because they added this on to a mobile home bill, actually. But oh, okay. it, it says a lot of things. But the main thing it says at the end is that as a landlord, which you guys know that we manage traditional properties also, mm -hmm. that we can set the rent at whatever rate we want to, um, as well as the security deposit. So it gives us the freedom that we should have as landlords. Um, the other really great thing about it is the fact at the end of this bill, it says that we can start evictions in three days. Okay. Which is huge. And it's funny because I had an interview with Indiana lawyer because, you know, they wanted an opinion from the Indiana State Real Estate Investors Association. And I okay. told Marilyn, so it's really simple. A tenant agrees to pay. They sign on the dotted line. They know what they need to pay. And if you can't pay it, you need to leave. So... You know, pay, you know, stay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it real clear. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and obviously, you know, certainly I have a heart and, you know, I understand things happen, yeah. um, you know, but that's just a huge testament to the fact that when you contact, you know, your representatives, it makes a huge difference. The fact that this bill got passed is, you know, especially for everything going on, is just a great, um, you know, just a great testament to real estate investors. Yeah. Do you want your constituent making decisions for you or you want to help them make the decision by having your voice heard? And that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, they're just going to make a decision. You know, that's they're right. going to lean one way or the other and they'd have no one else. They have no feedback and they're going to make a decision whether you like it or not. So a decision needs to be made. And why not be the person that is conveying that message to them? Be a part of it. So I'm, I'm a big believer in it. I didn't really know about how this all this stuff works until the last five or six years. And so I'm starting to see how we can all make a change together collectively, which is why I love Indiana State RIA because it's a lobby uh, effort as well to get change to happen, to protect us. And, you know, selfishly in Indiana, that's what we're doing because okay. Elizabeth and I are here in Indiana State RIA. But that that's the goal. And other states are probably doing the same thing, I imagine, too. There's probably called a different type of a group, right? You know, we're actually one of only five states that has a whole state RIA. Oh, okay. So we're very special. <laughs> we are unique in that. Do you know the other states? I don't off the top of my okay. head, no. Okay. And I will say, which thank you for bringing it up, Justin, is also the fact that we're having our convention in April. So April 15th through the 17th, so whether you live here, it doesn't okay. matter if you live here or if you live outside of um, Indiana, you're welcome to come. We're going to have it in person as well as on Zoom, so whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, we have um, Trey Hollingsworth. He's a local congressman very dynamic. He's a real estate investor also. Um, so if you can come, we're going to have some really fantastic speakers as well as we'll have other um, government representatives also. Are you speaking at that as well? I am. Yes. You are? I'm speaking at that too, aren't I? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little, got a little, little hour in there, I think maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Yes, it, it'll be a great time and you can sign up <laughs> at Indiana state RIA. Mm -hmm. Um, dot org so we would we'd love to have you fantastic all right elizabeth we've we started off with some good conversation i know there's some other things that you want to talk about so what's what's the next subject you want to you want to take down for today's podcast so it's really cool what's happening you know we have obviously a lot of turmoil here in the mm -hmm. u.s um but there's also there's always opportunities so there's a company called getaway and what they do are cabins um just small cabins they kind of they actually look like retrofitted um, shipping containers, but very okay. cool, very trendy. And just two weeks ago, they did a final raise of over $40 million. Um, so they've, they've done a total raise of $80 million. Um, and what it is, is they're, they're these little cabins. Again, they're very cool, very trendy. They're outside of major metropolitan areas. So they're outside of New York, Austin, Philadelphia, um, and, you know, large places, San Francisco as well, and a host of other cities. And they're in the woods. And what's really cool is that there's no Wi-Fi. And That's they, nice. yes, they have a little box. So you can lock up your, all of your electronics. So you can really just literally get away. So you're off the grid. You're totally off the grid. Yes. And 
what's cool about this also is that the founders, like they were trying to decide if they were going to do Wi-Fi or not. And they said, you know what, we're not doing Wi-Fi. And they're booked in some cases, some of their properties are booked out to the end of this year. Wow. And the other really cool thing about these guys are they are direct book only, which means you have to go to their website to book with okay. them. They're not on Airbnb. They're not on Verbo, Expedia, none of those. Okay. You know, so here's just, you know, really thinking outside of the box, right? Who today would be okay with not having Wi-Fi, actually finding this website, you know, so there's always opportunity, always, always, always. That's incredible. Well, good for them. I'm glad they see that there's a market for it and there's a need for it. That's, that's pretty interesting. So how small are these again? Like, is there a square footage? They're small. <laughs> like a hundred square feet? Like what, what are we talking here? <laughs> I don't remember for sure, but they also, which is really cool. They have, you know, just these teeny little tiny kitchen kitchenettes basically okay. in them also. So you can cook if you want to cook. Um, and then they have a certain amount of spacing between every cabin. And they also have a fire pit area, you know, so you can really just get out and enjoy nature. You can check out for a few days, right? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Excellent. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. I can't imagine what it's like because it's been so long since, well, at least for me, that I've not had access to internet. It would be pretty interesting. It, to, it would be. Yeah, to lock your feeling. phone away. Yeah. And especially if you were away from family, you know, your kids and stuff, it would be an even more interesting experience. Like if my kids were with me, it, it would be different because then I don't have any, you know, worries and not have to worry about somebody get a hold of me or something. God forbid something happens. But, you know, when when they're not with you, that's been like, OK, well, this is it. I'm on my own for a little bit. <laughs> I'll see you guys when I get back. Right. <laughs> that, that's right. So, yeah. So really cool, really cool th things, you know, in the short term rental area. And excuse me, and also just kind of a a little say, or not really a segue, but our January this year, we were mm -hmm. our gross reservations were eighteen percent higher than January last year. Oh wow! With less properties, we have three less properties. Um, no, that's yeah, that's that's correct. And th that was before COVID hit. So people are still, they're still traveling. We had a lot of people that delayed their Christmas vacation, mm -hmm. or not vacations, but their Christmas gatherings. Okay. Um, so, so we're still seeing, you know, a nice, you know, nice travel, so to speak. Okay. And that, that's in your business, right? Correct. So you have yes. an 18% increase from 20 to 21 from January, January, the month of January to the month of January, right? Uh, just oh, just the month. So just January, the month of January. Right. Okay. Yes, and January is always our it's always our slowest month. You know, people are recuperating from Christmas right. and. Um, so you said reservations. So does that mean they are the next week they're going to be at at the dwelling place, or does that mean it could be they've reserved it, but it could be in the future, like in, in the springtime or summertime. Like what, what does that mean when, when someone reserves? Yeah. Good question. So that was the gross reservations of <clears throat> those were actual stays in January. Oh, so okay. All we we're looking at. <clears throat> okay. So I know that brings me to a question. Um, not something we plan on talking about today, but what, what is that looking like for people that are just vacationers versus people that are needing your specifically your short term rentals for business purposes? Because I know in the past there was a lot of conventions and things like that and people needed to have short term stay. Is it flip flop to where it's it's more um, vacation versus business? We do, do have a lot more people doing vacations and coming to see friends and family mm -hmm. um, right now. We've got got about four or five of our properties um we have some longer term stays and they're here for work okay we have an auctioneer from illinois in one of our properties we have um a guy that does works on maintenance things at lily eli lily um so kind of a whole host of, of people staying here on on a longer term for work okay right. and we have this was really fantastic um you know, we had guests that have already booked for um, the Indy 500 in May. Nice. So we're very we're cool. very yeah very excited about that. 
Do you have properties that are close to the Speedway track? We don't. Okay. Our closest properties are about 20 minutes. So not bad. No, it's not bad. But well, I was just curious. I never asked you that before. I, I'm not sure where all your properties are located. I assume they're just kind of scattered across Indianapolis, uh, maybe outside of Indianapolis too. But Yes, we did have one in Speedway. We had one that's about two or three blocks from the track. Um, it was a four bedroom, one and a half bath. Mm -hmm. Very wonky layout for this, not a professional word, but it was a, you know, um, it was not a good configuration, you know, four bedrooms and you only have one full bath. So it was one and a half bath, which means it had one full bath and then one just little powder room, basically. So sink and toilet. And it was either feast or famine in yeah. that property. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. You don't know, you don't realize what a luxury it is to have multiple bathrooms until you live with multiple people. Uh, so we, when we blended our family together, there's six of us, right? Four kids and two adults. Now I've added a couple of pets. We'll count them to use the bathroom, but we had two full bathrooms and six of us in the house. And it was like a log jam because there was one upstairs and one downstairs. So it didn't matter where anyone was at. There was always a log jam or a, or a line to go to the bathroom. If you will, if someone needed to go to the bathroom. So now, we've positioned ourselves in a, in a different home and we have three full bathrooms and it makes a, a huge difference adding that extra bathroom with, with six people, because now you can split them up between two, two and two, right? So two people are designated to one bathroom, another two and another two, right? So this makes, it makes the world a difference to having those bathrooms as a luxury. Maybe that should be one of the key discussions today is the luxuries of having extra bathrooms. Yes. <laughs> so, cause I used to look at stuff, you know, when we were looking at houses, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, dreaming about what house I want to have. And I would see all these like five bedrooms, four baths. I'm like, why would someone need four baths? And then I get to a blended family and I realize, okay, four baths would be even nicer right now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all relative, right? <laughs> Exactly. And even for us, so we have a few properties that are three bedroom, one and a half bathroom. And I told my clients before I took them that we will not have the ROI because anytime you go above two bathrooms and a half for a short term rental, mm -hmm. if you have three bedrooms, you need two full bathrooms. Because okay. think about it, that's six people sharing yeah. one full bathroom. Right. That's one shower, right? Because a half bath by nature is just uh, like a pedestal sink and a toilet seat, right? Correct. There's no, there's no bath. There's no shower. No, and three quarters would be a stand up shower, right? With a right. non bathtub. Mm -hmm. And then a full bathroom would be a bathtub, shower, toilet, and a sink or a dual sink. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I so, can see <laughs> so if you have four bedrooms, are you required to have three full bathrooms to make it better for everybody? Or is two bathrooms still okay? We're okay with a four bedroom, two bath. Okay. Excuse me. A four three is obviously is better. We have two properties right now that are actually there four, three and a half, both of them. Um, and then we have another one coming that's going to be a four bedroom, three bath. Is that the largest footprint that you have? A four bedroom, three bath with your properties? Um, it's a four, three and a half. Four, three and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how, how is that configured? Is there a couple upstairs, a couple downstairs and a half? somewhere there are two full bathrooms upstairs a yeah. half bath on the main floor and then a full bath on the lower level also okay i think and, i was i was miscounting in my head thinking four bathrooms sorry oh that's okay <laughs> um, it does make a big difference and even so if you're a rehabber or if you're a developer if you build new houses just keep the more bathrooms the better and we just did, so we do, you know, project management and we mm -hmm. do a lot of design now also for clients. And we have a client that we did a design for. I'm a big fan of Jack and Jill bathrooms also. Um, so we're putting a Jack and Jill bathroom on the second floor. And then it's kind of funny because he wanted the half bath on the first floor to be not be anywhere close to the living room or to the kitchen. He wanted it totally off to the side in our layout. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Typically, you would have it close to the kitchen, right? Right. Okay. Right. So, um, but those things make a bathrooms are huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. In staying only at a couple of Airbnbs before uh, short-term places, 
uh, having the extra bathrooms with multiple kids is, is, is fantastic. So makes a big much, difference. It's much needed. Yeah. <laughs> Especially cause we would traditionally we would stay at a, like a beach house or somewhere close to a beach. And so it'd be kind of like a, a bigger, kind of like it was a multifamily and then they converted into just a big single family. So it would have like, you know, a lot of bedrooms and a lot of bathrooms so we can have us and maybe a few other people there as well. And it does make a difference when you have a lot more bathrooms to choose from and then sleeping arrangements as well. And the, one of the things that I don't like about how some of the Airbnbs, Airbnbs work or the short-term places is what they consider, um, you know, they have bedrooms and they have beds, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes they'll be counting like a, like a pull-out couch as a bed, which, you know, I guess can be great for like a one or two stay overnight, but it's not meant to be a longer term, short-term rental, if you will. Right. So I, I always get irritated when I'm searching for stuff and I'd be like, okay, I'm looking for like a multiple bedroom, but then they just list beds instead of bedrooms. I don't know if you've run across that before, but, um, some people, when they list that stuff, I'm just like, why do you do that? Like, you know, I, I want to know how many bedrooms you have. I don't want to have a bunch of random kids on different couches and stuff. I'd like them to have their own bedroom if they can. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. It's very important to pay attention to all of those details, whether you're <laughs> on Verbo or Airbnb, or if you're booking direct with somebody. That's very important to know. Exactly. All right, Elizabeth, did, did you have another topic that we can squeeze in before the end of this episode? Those were the, the main okay. ones that I had. Okay. I wanted to make sure we got everything in that we had planned on talking about. So um, one of the things that I'm doing coming up soon, uh, we're recording this episode in February and at the end of March, I'm actually going to be going to Houston to speak at a, a conference where there's going to be a few people live in person and most people will be on Zoom. So that'll be fun. So I'm going to moderate a note panel. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. So it's the Think Realty Conference. I don't know if they call it the conference or the expo, but it's, 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 I'm going to call it a conference and it's in Houston, Texas. So it's at the end of March, I think the March 26th and 27th, that dates sound about familiar to me. So, uh, I got asked to be a, a part of this, uh, very recently. So that was kind of exciting. And I didn't even know that they were having a conference because I guess I don't follow them closely enough to, to remember their conferences, but, uh, it'd be my first live event for the year or since last year, last February. So I'm excited for that. That's great. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And then we'll have state RIA after that or our local Indiana state RIA. So that'll be exciting too. So we'll have two months back to back of some live conferences. It'll be nice. Woohoo. It's a good feeling to get back in the groove, huh? It is. It is a good feeling. How about you? Do you have anything else coming up besides Indiana State RIA? I do. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at the Kansas City RIA in April. Okay. And then I was just asked to speak at the Chicago RIA. Um, they're not live yet, and I really I want to go to I want an excuse get a business excuse to go gotcha. to Chi Town. Yeah. There's a five star Michelin restaurant there that I want to go to. I hope it's still open. Um, so I'm waiting until they, um, until they're live to speak there. Okay. Very cool. Well, hope, hope that happens soon. Yeah. Speaking of restaurants in those bigger cities, I sure hope that a lot of them are be able to, are going to be able to survive as well. Cause there's a lot of nice places when you go to travel to those bigger cities where you just, you know, you want to have that experience, you know, and, that's something that I hope can continue to happen after uh, the dust settles, if you will, or the virus settles. So, Absolutely. Do you have any closing thoughts for today? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Just the, the idea that the riches are in the niches. So just Ooh. like these people that are doing the getaway cabins, right? Who, who would have thought? Um, you heard of the book, The One Thing? Yes. The book that was uh, talked about in a, an online event that I went to last month, or I'm sorry, this month, and uh, something that I look forward to reading. So um, I apologize. The author's name is escaping me, but uh, it's called The One Thing, and it's great for any entrepreneur in any business. So I'm Justin Bogart from Bright Path Notes. I'm Elizabeth with Elizabeth Mayora. All right. This is episode number five of season three. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Two Wealth Show is produced by Justin Bogart and Super E, sponsored by Bright Path Notes and Elizabeth Mayora. Thanks for listening and watching for our show. 